So welcome to Interpreting and Presenting Oral History once again. We are thrilled to have all our panelists here together. Um, I'm Jennifer Keel, the past president of SOHA from 2019 to 21. I'm involved with Oral History Association and been involved with our ward committee and archives interest group. My passion for oral history started when I earned my master's in history from Cal State Fullerton and started instituting community collections for Babel Island Museum, Laguna Woods History Center. The Korean Consulate's Office of Los Angeles in 2019 approached me after the 2018 conference in Cal State Fullerton. And now we're making a new collection for Multimuseum in Orange County. So I will be presenting that. And we also, um, will be joined with two other panelists and I will start my presentation and formally introduce Nicholas Harvey and Patrick Delagares shortly. So let's get started on my presentation. I'm thrilled that I can provide you with a report from California. And for those who know Oral History Association, I want to mention it's time to start thinking about your travel plans for October because we will be hosting that <laughs> event this year so very excited about that but because the topic today is California for me California community oral history I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what that looks like my day-to-day -day at Elisa Viejo Ranch and a number of other participants that partners and other groups that we've been able to work with over the years through my company. I founded with my sister called Semi Degrees. So we're contracted to support brand new agencies, existing collections, small museums, mid-sized museums. And right now we're instituting a new museum. Here's my background. Um, would love for you to follow me on LinkedIn, get connected. Let's get networked, share ideas. That's reason to be here is to always connect with conference attendees. So I'd be happy to serve in a liaison role for whatever maybe connection you may have to some of these. Um, my company has an education initiative. We do not look like work in isolation. The great thing is a consortium of scholars brings about curriculum ideas for primary, secondary, post-secondary education. My formal studies, again, are from Cal State Fullerton, and here's a biannual report from last year featuring some of the collections we're making accessible uh, to the California region and beyond. And we believe that the community itself should tell their own story. That's why we're all here is to bring people together to share and formally archive and then create access long term. And so that's my company's philosophy is to archive, preserve, and exhibit these. So we take interviews off the shelf, we digitize them, and then we implement them into public displays. So we continue to make sure that that's nurtured through formal internships through the universities in their area and just provide guidance from our workshops and just really believe in just getting out there in the community, collecting the stories and making them again, a viable part of the exhibition experience. So it always starts in the singular motion in oral history. A lot of times people get into it because of family history interest. Mine did not necessarily start from that journey. It was through a collection that the university instituted surrounding Europeans who immigrated to California. And with that as a baseline theme, I took that approach of thematic collections to my local history area and discovered that Babel Island had a museum and needed to index their long time stories with residents. In the process, of course, with personal archives, you discover that they have photographs, personal papers, memoirs, it will need to probably produce an oral history for which they have not done. Maybe they've written some portion of it. And then detailing their history with census records and newspapers always adds to, I feel like a final folder or in the digital compendium there as well of a life story and adds to a bigger collective story. So it's part of the process, of course, to collect the interview and best practices, high format, long-term preservation plan. But along with that, we believe in this theory of compounding that with other types of resources, primary and secondary, if we can make those available. And so that's built our collection over the years. So again, I started at the university 
and working and depositing interviews there, and then thinking about long-term plans for the community using open source technologies like YouTube, Omeka, and helping small to mid-sized organizations like Laguna Woods History Center, creating a website that's built on WordPress, and then serving as their digital archivist, like organizing their collections to see if maybe their relatives or other people related can be appearing in those digital records, and then helping the person who's being interviewed process some of those papers to be deposited in a long-term format. I always think Alessandro Protelli, he was such a gracious guest at our host university years ago, and he served as such an inspiration, of course, with his work. He's the grandfather of oral history in many regard him. His theory of um, reflecting on the Italian massacre of how does one perceive one event in history and the point of oral history contesting and changing a notion of history. And so he has helped me in my national transnational migration um, perspectives, which I take to collective memory and local events as well that maybe the official record is written some way, but we can always contest it if we collect the story. So he's a long-term mentor and then I have to thank his work. And then my mentor, uh, Cor Granada, who helped spearhead this conference in 2017, we had it at Cal State Fullerton. So along the way, you always think back to, well, how did I get here? <laughs> so, and then where we're going. So today I am happy to announce that we are launching this new project that opens this summer in Laguna Hills. It has been an incredible project because it spans 22,000 acres of Orange County, it used to be rangeland, and sheep land and citrus and acreage of agriculture to now five incorporated cities. And so now we get to tell the story of collective memory of how do these cities begin and interview residents who recall when the bunkhouse was the center of life, when El Toro had a train station and this just nostalgia continues. And these are the types of interviews that we are indexing on YouTube and hosting on our WordPress website and will be made available to all our public partners. So we work with other agencies that have major impact in terms of visitorship and signage programs that have viewers that can sign in and scan our QR codes and then learn the story of the people who live there. And we really center ourselves with the idea of people in place in our work. And so we interview them and then we feature them in social media newsletters. We will be placing their interviews in listening stations like on iPads and devising a reference library so people can see the traditional printed transcript or digital index transcript to research uh, the elders and those around them. So this is a welcome film that we generated that will be featured here shortly. And so for those who would like to take a look, you're welcome to see our welcome video. Part of our fold is art and history and they work together. And this public mural is a wraparound design. We have murals that have feature individuals that are historic persons and plaques that commemorate their historical place in our local history. And so we've been instituting a QR program that can be scanned in and you can listen to the stories that you're viewing. This is in the process. So we are generating more proposals for murals throughout the area to represent each five cities that were incorporated out of the area. And so our hope is that every listening station, every mural will be a place where people can visit, take a selfie and hear the stories of the people who used to live there before commercial development happened to the area. So we really want to allow people to think about the past in an innovative way. So this is a, just a quick film. Again, similar ideas to show change over time. Um, one of our partners is Elisa Vieja Ranch. It incorporated from the land and 7.7 .7 acres multidisciplinary project. Really amazing partnership because they have learning gardens, a farm that's hydroponics and it's very multiple agency again, engineering the, the source of life and food to table and nurturing the idea of where Orange County even originated. 
And then in the new historic barn, we tell the historic narrative of ranching families and how that evolved into the landscape that we know it. So we host events such as the Orange County Docent League and developing how we create a volunteer-based agency for people to come in and tell them how to create a museum. It's not every day you get to be a part of that process. So it's pretty exciting. So we have a QR code there already and people can scan in and see more digital resources, which include oral histories, of course, and other multimedia. And we really emphasize the change over time of our landscape. A newer agency that we've been working with is the California Rangeland Trust that encompasses the entire state and represents the larger swath of California landscape. And I had the privilege to edit um, this text for which a fa family of a now friend who resided in Julian, uh, this details the story of being born in a historic district and interviews with his son and being able to utilize my training and edit a text like this has been magnificent. And so we've offered to produce two more of these this year. So we go to the households, of course, and produce original art and create a bound transcript so that it will live in perpetuity through our museum and our partners that recommend that we look through the lens of state history, not just regional. Art, of course, is something that we all enjoy and living history, persons that represent a person who lived is an incredible way to interact with an exhibit. And so our primary matriarch, Nellie Gail Moulton, was a painter and a philanthropist and like educator and did everything that could create an Orange County vibrant art scene. And so we were really excited to feature her work here and have a digital Matterport mapped experience for which we'll be doing in our exhibits. It's a traveling uh, art show that will be lending itself to Soka University next year. But what we really like about this practice is that with historical reenacting, she is resolved to referencing every transcript and also any memoir she's written over time. And so this is why her her voice is really powerful. When you um, meet with her, it feels like it's the actual person. So I think in theater arts, um, because Nellie actually funded the Playhouse, it's a pretty cool practice. And so we're trying to bring back that tradition of taking the transcript and placing it on the stage. I think it's pretty cool. And so this is a highlight reel of the Matterport if you should choose to want to take a look at the virtual art show. Orange County Parks has amazing facilities. We're really pleased because we've partnered with two of the locations to provide historical narrative and programming with them. And so consulting on their projects, consult of looking at tapes, making them digital, looking at photos, digitizing those, and then pairing off where they left off. Maybe there's time to conduct more interviews with former residents and individuals who are part of the Saddleback Area Historical Society. So. That's what we've set off to do. We're looking to do more interviews this year, very excited. So for those of you wanting to learn more about what 70 Degrees does, please stay tuned and scan in and follow our field notes and take a look at what's next on our agenda. We're really excited as a small business agency to provide uh, historic resources to the surrounding areas. So thank you very much. And now I shall turn it over to Nicholas Harvey who will be presenting on oral history, community, and the pandemic classroom. And Nicholas is unique because he is a high school senior at San Ramon, California, and he's been engaged with oral history since 2019, where he designed a project to record interviews of local Vietnam War um, veterans. Although there, he states, an insufficient number of staff or narrators to continue the project to document pandemic stories in his community, um, he, he leveraged and found new knowledge because he was able to, to work on new projects. So last year, he interned at the Journal of Plague Year Archive at Arizona State University, where he recorded and transcribed oral histories. And he is committed to attend Stanford University and plans on continuing his involvement with oral histories there next fall. So I welcome Nicholas. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I will let me um, share my presentation 
Sorry, real quick. Uh, is it still loading? There, Ed, is, is, are you able to see it? Yes. Got it. Um, so as Jennifer already said, uh, my name is Nicholas Harvey and I'll be giving the presentation oral history community in the pandemic classroom. Um, very briefly, um, I'm an oral historian and a community historian um, I'm an employee at the local museum, the museum in the San Ramon Valley. Um, I, in the sake of time, I'll um, skip over the stuff that Jennifer already mentioned, um, but feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, so um, I'll be discussing my experience uh, designing and executing a oral history curriculum um, at a local middle school, Iron Horse Middle School. Um, and this uh, oral history curriculum allowed seventh grade students uh, to record and transcribe oral history interviews um, related to migration experiences. So that's primarily students interviewing family or sometimes a friend who had a migration experience of some sort. Uh, and I designed this curriculum while I was in a, a high school course um, that matched high school juniors and seniors with internships under uh, local teachers. Um, and my goal in doing this project um, was to have students develop an understanding of what oral history is and to allow them to analyze a um, primary historical source in a way that they might not be familiar with. Um, this is a direct quote from the um, introduction to the curriculum. Um, and so I wanted to introduce uh, the seventh grade class to the concept of oral history, um, especially because we were in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and I thought oral history, and I think it does um, provide um, a nice synergy with some of the issues that um, education has faced during the pandemic. Um, first off, um, there's been a lot of learning loss during the pandemic. And as a result of that, there's likely to be uh, more of a focus on the tr traditionally um, exalted fields, STEM and English, um, unfortunately to the detriment of history. Um, and hands-on methods of instruction are um, more effective at um, teaching students. So I wanted to do something hands-on um, so students would be able to uh, remember something and um, learn something new about history. Um, and in addition, um, oral history also requires interviewing someone. Um, and I wanted to um, introduce that social aspect as well. Um, and so now that leads to the question, why did I choose the topic of migration to uh, focus the curriculum around? Uh, so in California, seventh grade social science standards um, cover essentially world history from the fall of the Western Roman Empire through the Enlightenment. And within that, there's a lot of discussion of migration. Um, and in addition, the um, class that I was teaching had read the fiction book Refugee the semester before. Um, I did this project the second semester, uh, Refugee um discusses uh three fictional um refugees and their experiences um and so i tried to connect uh what students had already learned into the class in the classroom with this new discipline of oral history that most of them um, weren't familiar with and there's another reason i chose migration that i'll get to later uh so the lesson plan i designed had eight different lessons um covering everything from introducing students to oral history to um, having them record and transcribe their interviews. Uh, most of these lessons uh, were done in uh, one day of instruction. I did about two lessons per week. Um, I did a lessons two and three on the same day. So um, determining what makes a suitable interviewee and having them contact their, or their narrator. Um, and the I think lesson eight uh, was done over the course of two days. Uh, and I'll cover more about that later. Um, so the first lesson uh, was introducing students to oral history, um, and I was genuinely impressed. Um, student, most students seemed to um, grasp right off the bat what oral history was, um, the roles of the interviewer and the narrator, and also why subjectivity is an important part of the oral history experience. Um, uh, one thing that educators uh, might want to take note of 
is that, again, most students understood um, why subjectivity was important in oral history, um, but there were some students who um, said things like uh, oral history is more factual than other forms of historical resources or that it's um, better in some capacity, um, whereas it's one tool in the historian's toolbox. Um, so I included a, an anonymized response from a student, um, just an example of something um, that educators um, can look out for. Um, moving on to lesson three, there's not very much to cover here. Um, this is where um, the students contacted their narrators, um, but I wanted to discuss uh, the copyright form very briefly. Um, this is a copyright form that I adapted um, and I'll um, get to that later, but um, at the bottom of each of the two options, I made sure to summarize for the student um, what each option means um, in very basic plain English. Um, and that's something I tried considering uh, through this curriculum is to make oral history as accessible to a seventh grade audience as possible, and especially something difficult like copyright and Creative Commons licenses. Um, uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, lesson six, doing your interview, um, which is the primary uh, lesson of the curriculum. Uh, this is where students uh, actually recorded their interviews. Um, and in addition to migration connecting to what students were learning in the classroom, um, the topic of migration also provided a um, wide array of interviews that reflected the diversity of San Ramon. Um, San Ramon was only incorporated in 1983. And up until the um, 1960s, it uh, had around a thousand people, um, if that. Um, so it's a community that, that's largely based on migration um, and the interviews um, really showed that. Um, so just as a demonstration, uh, here's a word art uh, globe of some of the places that narrators came from. Um, it might be, too small to read if you're in person, um, but there are people who um, shared their experiences from San Francisco or Oakland, um, which are all within an hour of San Ramon. Um, people from Los Angeles who shared their stories. Uh, there are narrators from different US states, Hawaii, Ohio, New York, um, and there are a lot of international narrators, uh, people from the UK, from different regions of India, uh, from uh, South Korea, from Peru, uh, from Mexico. Um, and the topic of migration really allowed the diversity um, of the San Ramon community to shine through. Um, and as I said about lesson one, I was highly impressed with how um, students conducted their interviews. Um, students were really good at letting narrators speak uninterrupted, and that led to a lot of insightful uh, anecdotes and recollections that um, might not have been exactly on script, um, but that um, really um, provided a new um, insight. Uh, and students were also generally good at asking follow-up questions where they were needed. Um, I observed that a lot of the times narrators would um, speak a lot on a specific question, and so there weren't really uh, as much of a need for follow-up questions. Um, and also students um, introduced themselves, uh, and they also made sure to be um, courteous to their narrator. They thanked their narrator at the end um, of the interview. Um, some things that uh, teachers might want to take away. Um, students were generally good at asking follow-up questions, um, but sometimes there were um, areas where more follow-up questions could be used, um, and specifically um, not sticking to a script of questions or topics. Um, one of the lessons uh, before this, uh, students um, wrote a list of uh, topics and questions, um, not as a script, but as a resource to use during an interview. And if I did something like this again, I'd make sure uh, to emphasize that it's more of a resource than a script. Um, and in addition, um, a fair number of students uh, asked leading questions um, in their, their interviews. Um, we covered that before doing the interviews, what a leading question looks like. Um, so if I would do a curriculum like this again, I'd make sure to add extra emphasis on what leading questions can look like. Um, it's not just including the word good or bad in your question. There's a lot of different forms. So that's something I would cover again. Um, and lesson eight, 
uh, was the final lesson of the curriculum where students analyzed their interviews. Uh, they were asked to identify any errors in their recording. Um, and in my head, I thought factual errors, um, but as we'll see, students didn't necessarily interpret it that way. Um, additionally, students were asked to uh, determine whether the events that their narrator witnessed were firsthand or secondhand or a mixture thereof. Um, they were also asked to determine uh, how different uh, differences in the transcript and the recording. Um, there's a lot of emotion and tone in a audio recording that is not apparent in a transcript and students were really adept at identifying that. Um, and I also asked students how their interview fits into the wider historical narrative um, of the specific topic of migration um, that they chose. So how um, their narrator story fits into the broader discussion of migration from that state or city or country. Um, so in the text of the lesson plan, I didn't include the word factual when I discussed errors. Um, so students mainly didn't point out factual errors, um, but they did provide a lot of um, insightful um, uh, observations about their narrators. Um, a lot of narrators are from outside the United States from non Anglophone countries. And so they made the observation that um, that affected um, the interview. Um, and I think this is another um, way to uh, place to highlight that, um, especially with seventh graders or middle schoolers when you're doing oral history with the younger audience um, to be as direct as possible. So including factual error instead of error. Um, and also students were really, really uh, effective at considering how their narrator's perspective fit in with those of people um, around the narrator. Um, so this is a quote from uh, a student whose mother moved to San Ramon. And she said, uh, well, since the interview was from my mother's view, she was telling what she felt and went through. So her side of the story might have been different than what her brothers had been. Um, and as I mentioned previously, I asked students to describe how uh, their narrator's story fit into the wider historical context of uh, migration from that area. Um, in hindsight, I would have not included this question in the lesson plan. I think it was slightly ambitious um, for a seventh grade class. Um, I mentioned at the very start of the um, presentation that I reserved two days for lesson eight, and that was because I had um, an entire day allocated to students answering this question. Um, but even then, um, I don't think a lot of students understood the question, and also I don't think um, students in middle school have the um, knowledge to accessing historical databases or sources like that where they can determine um, a basic summary of what the historical context is. Um, so I would save this type of analysis for um, high school students uh, if I was going to do another oral history curriculum or if you're an educator who would like to bring oral history into the classroom. Um, and uh, some takeaways for educators. When I made this presentation, I wanted it to be as practical as possible for educators to um, have an experience to reflect on and be able to bring what I learned into their classroom. It was uh, really important to simplify concepts for the middle school audience. So for example, um, including uh, simplification in the legal transcript, in the legal form. Um, I also made sure um, to remove jargon where possible. Um, for example, um, I tended to use the word interviewee rather than narrator. In oral history, we have good reasons for using the term narrator, um, but for the seventh grade audience, I tended to use interviewee since that's the word they were already familiar with, just reducing um, the amount of jargon and terms that students uh, needed to learn. And in addition, um, Educators can also utilize existing oral history tools. Um, Baylor University's Introduction to Oral History Manual uh, was extremely helpful. A lot of the lessons, uh, I'd have students read uh, one of the one-pagers or part of the one-pager and we discuss it as a class. Um, and in addition, uh, the copyright form I adapted from a oral history consent form. Um, it has a Creative Commons license to adapt and reuse as long as you credit the original authors and also I'd focus on connecting 
uh, oral history in the classroom to real life and to other classroom content. Um, it'll help smooth uh, the introduction to a new discipline like oral history for students. And that's something I did with choosing the topic of migration. Um, if I had more time uh, delivering these lessons plans, I would have created opportunities for students to gain practice interviewing. I would have had them do practice interviews with each other. Um, I only had a month and a half to two months to uh, teach the lessons. So I was cramped on time, but if I had more time, I would have done that. Um, and in addition, um, if time allows, uh, I think it's important for educators to um, work with libraries and historical societies to um, hold copies of transcripts and to keep them. Um, one of the important things about oral history is not just creating a new primary source, but preserving it for the future. Um, again, feel free uh, to use and to adapt the curriculum. Um, it's available by scanning the QR code to the left. Uh, it's also available at tinyurl.com slash Harvey Soha 2022. Uh, that will lead you to a Google folder with all of the lesson plans, uh, the copyright form, um, and some other resources as well. And finally, um, that's my presentation. Um, thank you for listening. And you can also scan the QR code on the bottom if you're interested in connecting with me on LinkedIn. Um, thank you all for listening to my presentation. Excellent. Thank you so much for the insightful access to your curriculum. Next, we have Patrick Delagares, who is the archivist for the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the Oklahoma State University Library. He oversees the processing and preservation workflows and provides technical support to their interviewing team. He holds a Digital Archives Specialist Certificate from the Society of American Archivists, and is a 2019 Columbia Center for the Oral History Summer Institute Fellow. His interests include digital preservation, collection management, and discoverability of audiovisual materials and community engagement by archival institutions. Please welcome him to our presentation schedule. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, let me go ahead and share my slides. Um, I am in Las Vegas and it seems there is a plane flying overhead every other minute. So I uh, apologize for that in advance, but I appreciate um, you being willing to, to endure. Hopefully it's not too distracting. Um, okay, so hopefully everyone's able to see my slides. Um, my name is Patrick DeGlaris. Um, like Jennifer said, I am the archivist for the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. And today I'm gonna talk about, I think everyone's favorite subject, transcripts. Um, and so specifically, I'm gonna be focusing on narrator edits in transcripts and um, really thinking about the utility uh, they can serve for um, historical documents for, for public access and just the, the value that that may be there um, for us to use. And so especially with the changing digital technologies and ways we make um, interviews available, it makes me wonder how, um, what, what is there to gain by allowing narrators to edit their transcripts. And so it won't be too exhaustive uh, of an overview, but I'll highlight a few different um, definitions or things about transcripts as we move along. And um, there's been a lot of scholarship on this in the past, and I really wanna highlight Teresa Bergen's most recent book, Transcribing Oral History, which is a great resource for anyone interested in the topic. Um, and you'll see on almost every slide, a couple either screenshots or quotes from edits we've gotten back from interviews. And I thought um, you'll learn a little bit about what I've been working on, but it was just fascinating seeing the things people did or, or comments they made when looking at their, their interviews. Um, so let's get started. Um, so I work at the uh, Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. We were founded in 2007. Um, so right at really the peak of, of transitioning to the what we call the digital age of oral history, which um, fortunate for me as an archivist meant we were mostly born digital from the get go. And so we you know, don't have the baggage many institutions do with having analog or physical media that has to be digitized. There is some of that. Um, but it's not nearly to the extent I know many other organizations have. So that was a, that's a big plus that I'm 
uh, grateful for um, for working here. Uh, we house over 2,000 interviews. Um, over 1,400 of those are online, which means part of our process is um, any that were at least done internally versus donated collections. Um, we've sent out a transcript for narrators to review, and so um, I have a quote here of just kind of the standard language we use. I'm sure it's familiar uh, with a lot of people. Um, of you know, this is focus on the accuracy, look at names, dates, thinking like that, try not to rewrite it. Um, there will be, you know, it will be awkward because it's the spoken word and written form. And, and so, you know, respect that verbal nature. And so um, starting off, uh, the kind of two questions I have there at the bottom are, are kind of what I was thinking about um, are how many of our narrators actually abide by this request. And I think most of us anecdotally can say they disregard it pretty pretty commonly. It's not something that you know people think about. And if that's the case, how does our understanding of the utility of the transcript compare to theirs? And so you'll see how that kind of comes to play of how can we maybe um, accommodate their the way they envision the transcript into the, the documents that we that we create and, and make available. So over this past year, um, I've been slowly going through a lot of the, the transcript edits that we've received from narrators and just briefly categorize them into to rough groups to kind of get a, a sample of, of how are, what is the distribution of, of the extent of edits that narrators are making. And so um, part of this was to see how interviews are um, interacting with their, their transcripts um, to get a sense of how transcripts deviate more significantly from the original transcripts. I was interested to see what are the, the discrepancies between the two. Um, and then also as, as the archivist, really just trying to uncover every stone in our archive. So um, all, all in an effort really to better inform us of our current practices and communication with narrators to see um, what, are, what are ways we can improve or conversations we can have to better um, understand and accommodate um, this, this kind of dialogue. And so uh, you'll see here roughly, I, I looked at about 250 transcripts so far um, with kind of a random sampling of you have politicians, authors, farmers, conservation agents, people from all across Oklahoma. Um, and you'll see the, the largest category I have is um, revisions for clarity. And so I kind of categorize these either as they didn't send anything back or had no edits to make. Um, minimal edits, meaning they actually listened to the recommendation we made of focusing on accuracy. Um, revisions for clarity, meaning more, they, they either rewrote or added context all um, in a sense to improve the intended meaning of what they said, um, which, so it's kind of a squishy area, it kind of captures a lot, but it wasn't, you know, um, crossing things out significantly or, or rewriting things to where there were necessarily new meanings um, being created. And then finally, heavy revisions or redactions. So, you know, pages or paragraphs crossed out or rewritten, you know, that where you really are getting new new meaning um, or, you know, new um, content taken or, or added to the transcript. And so um, looking at this, you know, the smallest category are people who so far less than, I think, maybe 15% of these interviews so far um, did just focus on accuracy. So that was something I thought was interesting. Um, and really the bulk of them, if they sent anything back was look at, improving clarity. And so a lot of these quotes you'll see are definitely pointing out that idea of like, oh my gosh, this is horrifying to read. And so um, those are just interesting um, preliminary takeaways as I kind of continue to compile this data um, and just thinking about um, having a tangible way to record or understand these into some database that we have a record of. So this was just a helpful way to understand it more than just anecdotally as transcripts come in. So kind of going to the basics briefly, um, I really like this definition of what do we mean by transcript of, of the process of transferring the spoken word into written form. There's lots of ways people handle that. You know, is it verbatim? Is it kind of subjectively editorialized to make it, you know, improve its meaning? All sorts of ways to do it, but it, it is that process we're talking about. You know, we can call it an interpretation, a translation, whatever it may be, it is, it is taking what was spoken and, and creating turning it into the written form. And so it's broad enough to accommodate lots of different ways that looks like, but um, you know, thinking historically, uh, we know this was the primary way uh, researchers access trans um, interviews. It was transcripts. We know even in the early decades of the field, 
it was only transcripts that were kept, a lot of recordings were, and so it was, you know, partly maybe for feasibility and, and other reasons. Um, it has been predominantly the way researchers engage with oral history. So we know it's important. Um, and we also know since at least the 1980s, um, there's been a lot of pushback to the, the primacy it has over the original recording, you know, um, thinking about Portelli and, and really the emphasis on oral sources and allowing them to kind of speak for themselves. Uh, but some of those kind of setbacks being how it discourages listening to original recording, it can be expensive, and we'll talk about that later. It's a privileged resource to create both in the labor, having a team who can do it, and also the budget to, to pay them. I know we estimate about 30 hours of labor for an interview from research to getting it online, and a significant chunk of that is just transcribing and editing. So it's no, it's no small feat um, for programs or practitioners to produce um, a transcript. And finally, um, like was in, uh, alluded to previously, uh, it doesn't capture all the nuances of the spoken word. So there's there's things missing. I think we know these things. This is I don't think any of this is necessarily new to a lot of us. Um, and I I like some of these definitions here uh, or, or descriptions because they kind of broaden uh, ways we understand it. So we know there there is uh, the verbatim transcript. We know there is a how can we create a one to one transcript just for accessibility or whatever. Um, we may be using it for, but um, we also know there's efforts. We have, you know, a couple uh, prominent practitioners here, Richie, Portelli, and Frisch, all pointing at this idea of how the transcript um, can represent the intended meaning versus um, the exact what was said. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting approach of understanding we know this is a subjective interpretation. So rather than you know, pretending it's not that we can create a written verbatim transcript and have it be a suitable replacement. Let's acknowledge it's a, it's a subjective interpretation and, and kind of lean into that and understand that. And so um, we know that there's potential loss of information um, by this if it's selectively editing it or um, as Francis Good says, there's a fear that the distinction between primary and secondary sources can be muddied or ignored. Um, but really, it's this process of improving it for readability. You know, there's maybe two camps. Um, of verbatim versus readability and how you navigate that. I think those are tend to be where people often go when thinking about transcripts. Um, and so some scholarship that's been done talking about narrator reviews and maybe the value of it. Uh, Stephen Seeloff here talks about it as an extra ethical layer. It allows people to see what they said, make sure they're comfortable with it, um, maybe an opportunity to clear up any inaccuracies or mistranslated or, or mistranscribed um, content. Um, it can be, you know, as Eleanor Maze says, um, oftentimes it can end up being a written autobiographical memoir, basically meaning it's significantly different from a verbatim transcript of the interview. Um, and I like how she says it's very much their prerogative to do so. So again, that's kind of challenging maybe the utility institutions often see in it. And, and in her, in what she's saying, it's making space for what the interviewee wants it to be. And one way that can look is, uh, is a, a, a type of memoir. And so we'll kind of talk about that down the road too, with some examples of what that looks like. Um, and then kind of going on, you know, a lot of these um, examples are really getting at these ideas of um, there is value in, in looking at um, reasons for narrators to interact with it. And so uh, Francis Good again says, it's only problematic when there's no context to, to communicate when there are discrepancies between transcript and recording or or if there are any. Um, but I think a lot of this goes into this idea that there is value in understanding the agency narrators have for, for contributing to the historical record. It's not a one and done process, but how is it possible for them to continue to, to shape what is ultimately being created, whether it's just in the recording or whether it is in this, this new product that's created? And is there space to accommodate both of those things, knowing that there may be um, distinctions between them? And I, I know it's often can be seen as an effort to rewrite or suppress the original interview, but um, I think in the same way Portelli argues against the written word having emphasis or priority over the oral uh, sources, it makes me think in the ways, um, what is the danger of emphasizing oral sources to the point where we minimize narrator's abilities to make meaning in a written transcript that they modify? So how can it be another opportunity for, for analysis or or anything else. Um, so thinking about how these edits are incorporated, just kind of looking at what's out there, I think it's common to make changes in the, you know, in brackets to show, you know, these are certain distinctions made if they're, you know, usually if they're smaller um, corrections or whatnot. 
um, or maybe an addendum if it's a significant portion. Um, I've seen uh, Gua Shankar, the folklife specialists at the American Folklife Centers talked about how they've created a narrative manuscript, basically a distinct from the verbatim transcript, a distinct product um, because of significant revision. So they've actually made space to represent both of these things to show the value of what a narrative's man manuscript or, or edited transcript can be. Um, and then, you know, Ohms also has a tool to show edits while retaining the verbatim transcript. So, so it's not a new thing. I'm not introducing a new idea here. There has been effort to, to allow both things to exist, the verbatim transcript and the, the revisions that a narrator might have. But, um, you know, in any event, it is that communication and context of the object being described to, you know, to show why there might be discrepancies between all these different um, products. And so, um, uh, again, Francis Good says that, you know, the, the changes made to the transcript um, in part can become a second primary source. So thinking about it as a new primary source, and if the information is what respondents want on the record, then it should be just as important as their first thoughts. So thinking about that, you know, not, not just thinking about um, what we have to gain or our processes, but making that space for, for um, opportunities for narrators to continue to contribute to this historical record that, that we are, are creating. Um, so kind of my, my last couple of slides are really uh, thinking about questions or, or maybe some issues to think about. Uh, I think a common one that comes up is, is what is the authoritative version? You know, so if, if there's three different versions out there, two different transcripts and a recording, what do you cite? Um, you know, that can be a common um, stumbling block for thinking about this process. Um, how do you represent the transparency of all the different ways an interview can look in different transcripts or recordings? Um, Again, thinking about privilege opportunity to create transcripts, both by the program, but also um, by who, who has the means and ability to respond and send back revisions. You know, how is the sample size um, biased towards those um, who are able to do that for, for whatever uh, variables you can think of? So how is it skewed towards people maybe of more means or privilege to, to have that ability to send back revisions? So these are all imperfect, um, I think, legitimate issues. I don't think there's uh, any prescriptive way to think about whether you should do transcripts or how you should do it. But in just thinking about the, the decades long processes we've, we've had in the field, um, these are all things I think we oftentimes continually have been, been grappling with. And so my, my final kind of questions to think about um, are, how do you balance incorporate, incorporating narrator edits with allowing interviewees to have agency over their stories? So, you know, I we can think of the edited transcript, maybe it's not authentic anymore of the interview. And, and is that okay? Are we willing to allow that distinction to be made? Um, some of that goes to, I think, what are we using the transcript for? Is it um, verbatim? Is it a memoir? Is it an access tool? Um, and, and thinking about all of those things, it, you know, it goes back to what we want to use it for and maybe what the narrator wants to use it for. Um, and what is lost when we don't make space for narrator edits? And so I really like the quote I have at the bottom is a woman who reviewed her transcript maybe a year later after she did the interview and it was after her sister passed and originally her sister wasn't in named in the interview, but after her sister passing in that interim, she thought it was important to try to include her name into the record. And so she's thinking about that for their family legacy, I think on one hand on a personal level in the transcript they own, but also for the public record going forward. And I think that's just one small example of the value that narrators have in not just the original recording of what was said, but in the context um, and reinterpretation of what they're saying in an edited transcript. And so um, kind of just wrapping up here, how can we ethically collaborate with interviewees, transparently reflect discrepancies? Um, and if we do all those things, can we create a space where transcripts take on a new layer? It can actually be an additional expression of the stories that are shared or shaped by the interviews? Can it be a new point of analysis for us to compare with the transcript or with the original recording to see the meaning and maybe the discrepancies in the, in the instances and the meanings that were made in both the recording and the transcript? Um, and so I wanna end it with this idea that um, if the interviewees are more worried about their transcript than the recording, what responsibility do we have to take their concerns or edits more seriously? That as a field, we can focus on orality, and I think we should. It is an important aspect and essential to our work. But if interviewees are focused on that written record, 
um, in ways we may not be? How do we navigate our own expectations and communication with them um, to make space for that? So I'm kind of just gonna end it here again, looking at this um, these survey results. It, I, I'm excited about this partially to have a data set to see how narrators are actually interacting with their, um, their interviews to see um, what are lessons that, that our program can learn by the ways our narrators are interacting with them and how can it shape the ways um, we use their edits or we incorporate them or make them available to the public. So I think I'll end there, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. So in this portion of our conference, we will open up the table for those who may want to pose questions. You may do so by unmuting yourself or you also could all place it in the chat here. Um, my first question, I'll just start with Nicholas. Um, my intrigue with your work with future planning, with partnership, I thought that was so excellent that you left that hanger um, and for you, I was interested in finding out what your, what that looks like, your uh, product in a way, like you have left us with a Google Drive of access point for those who are educators so eloquently to look at your format. And so what would be your future project? Um, I'm so excited to hear about. So if you would share a little bit about that partnership with the library idea. Oh, um, I was mainly saying that as something that educators should consider doing rather than something that um, I did. Um, however, I um, did talk about uh, with the library at Iron Horse Middle School about donating transcripts to them uh, from people who are from narrators who um, marked that option on the copyright form. Um, I still need to refine the transcripts for those narrators. I've been very busy in the past um, year or so, um, but I'll have more free time in the next few months. And uh, my goal is to be able to give those transcripts to the Iron Horse Middle School Library and hopefully as well, um, possibly the Community Library and the Museum of the Santa Monica Valley Library. Um, so Excellent. Your question. Yeah, it sounds like a, a great plan. And for those who may be looking at yours as a sample, um, just to model, model in their local library and whatever outlook they could take these bound transcripts or however it is digitally accessible materials um, to the community at large. So I think you have a great plan and outline a wonderful project. So thank you for that. Patrick, your lingering thoughts in regard to the way we handle our transcripts versus the, the media itself and, and the way that narrators prioritize that has really left me thinking about my own work. So thank you for um, introducing us to your lingering thoughts in terms of how we should be handling both source materials. And I'm really wondering when given the chance for narrators to edit their words um, they seem to come in a variety of data sets. So um, thank you for providing us with an insight as to your collection and body of work. But um, maybe you could provide some feedback um, with your lingering question. <laughs> how, how should we handle <laughs> this in terms of narrators preferring a written bound word over the interview media, whether it be just the audio or video itself? Yeah, and like I said, it's hard to be prescriptive with this because there are so many different um, variables to this, whether you have those records, you know, you keep them, you retain them, or you have transcripts in the first place. Um, I I thought about this mainly in, in I think, listening to Bertelli talk once about, um, you know, how interviews can often be a moment, you know, it's, it's meaning made in that moment and it's informed by everything in the past and the positionality of every, of, of the, the interviewee and interviewer. And it just made me think about how with transcripts, it's another opportunity for someone to, to kind of interpret their own, you know, in a written format. And, and so I, it's hard to say for us, we, we've typically done the, the bracket method in terms of, you know, you'll add certain um, edits that were made in that way. But in, in just the, the really the, the privilege of having all of the revisions just in our office and the paperwork with the release forms, it made me think like, 
these have such a research value or at least an interpretive value for for our own um, kind of analysis of these interviews that I was just, you know, they're just kind of sitting on the shelf. And so that's really what, what inspired me to start thinking about this is, um, you know, how can I look at that and, and understand, you know, ask the question like, why? Not just, we made these changes. Some of them are easy, like they spelled something wrong or, you know, they don't. I, one of the edits I, um, I have up there is someone changed, they mentioned a poet that they're inspired by. And, and in the edit, it was like, oh, he's, you know, stabbed me in the back twice. So I changed it to a different guy. And so things like that, where it's like, there's value in that, you know, and sometimes we'll add maybe the name that's changed, but we don't add the context of why it was changed and things like that. And then, um, so I, I just thought, you know, trying to understand the thought processes that are motivating these, especially when they're more robust than just simple dates and names. Mm -hmm. um, it made me think so many people are, are making those level revisions that how can we use that as an opportunity to understand, you know, how they're reinterpreting what they said or adding mm -hmm. more context that we have not really captured um, as well in, in the past. So that's probably not really an answer, but um, just more of the my, my mind and just kind of thinking about this. It's fascinating. I think it's more like the, I'm not sure how you would derive the the usage title of a heavily edited transcript to that, um, because I do in my own collections have some, and I have difficulty even in the naming principle because it's not verbatim and it's sort of quasi memoir. And so how do we, in the collective sense of capturing and storing and disseminating these um, in part of our practice, like have that as part of the addendum <laughs> of, you know, as you continue further edit your words, um, we may have this product, new product in a way that is available. And so um, it's fascinating because I, I've seen it and just, I know it's a growing concern with how we handle that. And so it's it, certainly the field's evolved. And so it continues to change. So <laughs> with the way you adjust it and, and the manner in which you edit and um, supply those revisions and the, the personal anecdotes are very interesting to me, how we all, if given the chance to be interviewed, I think would feel in a similar right <laughs> of having our own words modified. So I, I all honestly respect um, our narrators in that position as well, but it's, it's a unique thing that we're um, witnessing and providing access to. So thank you for your thoughts and presentation on that process. Well, for the sake of time, we're coming at the uh, tail end of our uh, meeting. So if there's any further questions for those who are online or it just might want a chance to say something, please do so. Okay, so I think at this point at our presentation schedule, I will end our recording. <laughs>